Drivers, start your engines. You are now listening to the fastest show on iSports Radio. My name is Taryn Rodriguez, inviting you to take another lap of the Extra Mile here on June 17th, 2021. And ladies and gentlemen, race fans of all ages, we have so much to get into when it comes to the world of racing. From NASCAR to IndyCar, all the way to Formula One, we have quite a bit to talk about. And yes, I said it correctly, my name is Taryn Rodriguez, but I'm not alone. I've got plenty of other guests here, as this isn't my show. This is theoretically Daryl Kinsey Jr.'s show, along with two others. So let's meet our co-hosts, such as Daryl Kinsey Jr. Daryl, how are you doing, buddy? Hey, I'm doing well, and that was a great rendition of my intro. Hello, everyone. Uh, Taryn is here, because I didn't think I was actually going to be here today. But due to uh, some changes... In my schedule, I was actually able to make it. So thank you, uh, Taryn, for hosting tonight. Absolutely. And I am glad to be on here for the second time in my iSports Radio tenure. And with us also today, we have Michael Ward. Michael, how are you doing today? I'm doing really good. How are you guys doing today? Doing excellent. And last but not least, we have none other than Chris Lehman. Chris, how are you doing, buddy? I'm doing great tonight, Taryn, and uh, thank you for joining us, and congratulations on two years with IE Sports Radio. That's an amazing accomplishment, and uh, you know, we're, we're happy that you're here celebrating with us tonight. <laughs> it's a complete honor and a great pleasure, and yes, I did reach two years with IE Sports Radio, and, but I don't really want to make this all about me, but... I appreciate all of you making note of that. So thank you very much. And without any further delay, let us get on into the racing action as, once again, we have a lot of news to talk about in all aspects of the racing world. It's quite a bit of news to talk about. So fasten your seatbelts and let's get on into the racing action. So... First and foremost, we have a little SRX talk, and as all of you know, we have been putting in a real effort with our fans on Twitter, or the uh, the Extra Mile crew has been putting in a lot of effort with the fans on Twitter. We are more than active, we are more active than we have been historically, and if you aren't following us already, we highly recommend that you do so. You'll find the latest news, short but sweet commentary on ongoing storylines, polls to engage with the crowd and audience, and of course, some racing memes. Based on the news we've heard from Pirelli tires this week, I assume they'll be the primary focus of Formula One fans' memes. But more on that later. In the program, we have a lot more to talk about, such as the point of this opening statement is that we will be doing a weekly poll, most likely on Monday, where we'll ask a question, and we will lead the show off by breaking down and discussing the topic. This week, we asked you all if you watched the... The inaugural SRX racing event at Stafford Motor Speedway in Stafford, Connecticut. 83% of you said that you watched the race, which is absolutely amazing. Great job to all you racing fans, and thank you to those that follow the Extra Mile. Chris, you are one of those 83% of people who watched the SRS last weekend. What were your thoughts on the race Had if you watched it? Yeah, I watched it, and I thought that it was great. Um, that short track feel, you definitely got that. Um, it was awesome seeing the pros versus the short track local legends. 
Um, and the short track local legend won. Uh, Kobe ended up beating out uh, all the pros on a couple restarts and, um, you know, showed that those short track guys can can run with the big dogs. And I just thought that it was a great race, and I'm looking forward to the next five weeks for some more SRX action. Excellent stuff. Excellent stuff there, Chris. How about you, Daryl? Did you watch the SRX race by chance? I I did watch the SRX. I was a little tardy to getting to the start. I had been busy on Saturday, but I did get a chance to watch it. And I'll be honest, it was a lot of fun seeing a lot of the legends of old getting out there. Of course, Kobe Howard kind of stunk up the show on the SRX regulars and won the race. But these guys haven't been in a car in a while. And on the other side, Howard has won like 30 features at Stafford. So he knows his way around that racetrack. It was a lot of fun. They did make some changes to the format. Uh, I didn't really like the whole fun flag thing where, you know, leader got out too far and they threw the yellow. Um, I'm good on that. But other than that, it was a great show. Great stuff. Great stuff. How about you, Michael? Did you watch the SRX race by chance? Yes, I did. And it was a lot of fun, uh, like they all said, seeing all the uh, old racing drivers that we grew up with, uh, mixing up with the short, uh, the uh, younger short track drivers, you know, I was glad to see some of the older names, uh, like Greg Biffle, uh, Stewart out there. It was just good to see, you know, names that I grew up with racing again. Great stuff right there. And uh, I actually watched uh, some of the SRX racing, and I was I actually did not know this, that Doug Kobe was a local there. So I... Re- the fact that a local managed to win that event was absolutely amazing, according to the commentators. And I'm like, awesome stuff. Like, that's always, like, the greatest come full circle moment where a local wins it. And he – and I actually dug the commentary. I liked the commentary quite a bit. Like, honestly, it like, especially when they mentioned that fact. And I was like – some good stuff right here and the commentary really kept me engaged when it came to this race and honestly if i gotta hear more of this stuff (laughs) like personally like that was actually my first time listening and it's certainly not gonna be my last so it seems like we're all in agreement that the srx race didn't really disappoint correct i i liked you you mentioned the commentary i liked most of the commentary Mm mm-hmm yep I was not a fan of Danica Patrick on color commentary. I'm going to be honest. Mm, okay. Yeah. Yeah. It was. It was. It was. It had its ups and downs. Like it was mostly good, like you said, but it wasn't the greatest. But I can't knock it too much. So, <laughs> so there's that, and I'm glad most of us here agree on that. So, so when it came to the fan feedback. It seemed like most of the fans appreciated it, and some of them really liked that the local Doug Kobe won as well. So, as for the changes in this coming week in Knoxville, we have shorter heats and a feature race, and then we also have drivers that will be in the same color car as last week, and names will be larger to help elevate some fan confusion during the race, because... Nothing sucks worse than mistaking one car for another, and then for another, and then for another. So, anyway, Tony Stewart currently leads the standings with 36 points, but Bobby Labonte is in second place with 32, so he's not too far behind. Ernie Francis is in third place with 31, while Elio Castroneves is in fourth with 30, and Tony Cannon is in fifth place with 26 points. While Michael Waltrip, Paul Tracy, Willie T. Ribs, Mario or Marco Andretti, and Bill Elliott round up the top ten when it comes to the SRX. So great stuff right there. The top, the race for the top is pretty tight, and honestly, I like when it, I like these tight little competitions just because it makes it so exciting and it gives us that little drama and flair, don't you think? Yeah, it really gives it, uh, it really, when you compress it like this, sorry, it really makes it more exciting. We've seen NASCAR try to do this a little bit with the stages, but 
the way they've got it set with the two heats and then the feature, I like it a lot. I thought for some reason they were going to split the heats and have two sets of heat ones and two sets of heat twos, but I do like having all the cars out there for both heats, although if they did split it, you would have more time with more cars on track. So that's something for them to think about going forward. Very true, and yeah. I couldn't agree with you. Sorry about that, Chris. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, yeah, Daryl, I agree with you. I think splitting the heats and doing, you know, six and six would be great. Um, but I also kind of liked how, and it's kind of a trick to NASCAR fans, but the heat races are paying out points. So mm-hmm. you'd either have to take out the points or, um, I don't know. I don't know how you get around that, but. It's kind of almost like sneaky stage racing, what SRX is doing, and it'll be funny to watch and see if fans really like it or if they grow to hate it. Because at the end of the day, you've got three races and three points paying laps on an SRX night, just a rose by any other name, basically. (laughs) It's stages without being stages. Yep. It makes me wonder if NASCAR just called them... Heat one, heat two, and and the the feature race. If, if NASCAR fans would probably love it, and they wouldn't have to do anything other than rebrand stage to heat. Yes, I feel this whole thing is pretty much staged, no pun intended, with all the heats and whatnot. And I think this is eventually going to grow to most. SRX fans like no one's gonna get pleased with anything like because there's no pleasing everybody because if that were the case then they would have probably just stuck with the old system and then just kept on going forward and then kept on going forward but honestly I think this whole system is going to grow on everybody I think the whole shorter heats and then the feature race is going to be something special to watch for especially as time goes by eventually everyone's going to get used to it and honestly people aren't like satisfied then you gotta be patient or just go bye bye as we welcome larry b in the chat room he says he says the the four famous words of racing drivers start your engines and he says he has a question so definitely do type it up in the chat room larry b i appreciate you tuning in all right, and he says we sound good, so that is great news right there. So jumping over from SRX, we have some NASCAR news, and we have quite a bit of NASCAR news. First and foremost, we have the All-Star Race in Texas that happened last week, and fans were pretty much split. They either hated it or they loved it. There was no middle ground. There was no in-between. Kyle Larson won his third race in a row, and he won a whopping $1 million dollars. The last time Hendrick Motorsports lost a race was May 9th. So that's kind of your Snapple fun fact of the day. And this week we head to Nashville for the Ally 400 on Father's Day. It has been a couple of years since we raced at Nashville. And the hype is absolutely real. Everyone is excited for the return to Nashville. And boy howdy, I am as well. The most famous invocation in all of motorsports when Pastor Joe Nelms thanked God of Chevrolet, Fords, Dodges, Sonico, Ra- Sonico Racing Fuel, Goodyear Tires, but most importantly, his smoking hot wife, Lisa. Will we see a tribute to this? News broke today earlier before the show came on, that NASCAR is exploring their options for an all-electric companion series. There is not much known about this, but we will track in and provide more information as it becomes available. And then Fox is going to be continuing its coverage of NASCAR, but it has concluded for this year. So tune in to NBC to to hear Dale Earnhardt Jr., Steve Letarte, Rick Allen and Mark Martin call the rest of the season. And then our last bit of news is that GMS is trying to move from the Truck Series to the Cup Series in 2022. And keep in mind, GMS is the best Chevy truck team out there for you rookies out there who are listening for the first time. So let's jump to our nice little panel here. So Daryl, what can you say about the All-Star Race and what did you like and what didn't you like about the race? All-star race. Uh, how much time we got? 
lot to say, and I'm going to be honest, none of it was good. Uh, I was on the grid. Uh, I was on Grid Talk Live with Kobe Lambeth yesterday, and I got into a little bit there. I hated the All Star race. I'm just going to throw it out there. I did not like one second of that race. The five ten package to steal a Matt White term, chuck it in the bin. It's awful. Stop slowing the cars down. I have no idea what that driver introduction for the All Star race was supposed to be. Like it was probably great for the fans at home. But it just looked like a whole lot of noise, and I have ADHD, so I couldn't focus at all, and I can't focus normally. So you can tell how much I was struggling. And then the official anthem of NASCAR, having Sammy Hager sing, I can't drive 55. Okay, let's break the myth on that right here. The only reason that that song is even known for NASCAR fans is because it was in a Napa commercial way back when Michael Waltrip was doing his thing with Napa and he had the 56 car and they said, I can't drive 55. And Mike asked him, could he turn it down? And Mike said, could you, and uh, Sammy said, could you drive, could you drive faster? That is the only reason that song had any play. That commercial has not been on in a decade. That is not the anthem of NASCAR. And I know I'm getting on a rant. I didn't mean for this to be a rant. I didn't like this race. Can we please find some seriousness when we are broadcasting NASCAR? Formula One does it the right way. They treat each race like it's the Super Bowl. NASCAR treats, and their broadcast partners for some reason, treat the NASCAR races like it's the ballad of Ricky Bobby. One of these is growing audiences. One of them isn't. That's all I'm going to say about the All-Star race. Whew. That is some great opinions, and I totally, I totally love your opinions and takes on this, and your rants. And you need not to apologize, as one of my friends once said: "Never apologize for greatness." But anyway, Chris or Michael, did either of you want to chime in on the All Star race? Um, I just like Daryl said, I just wasn't a fan. I just couldn't get into it. You know, it was bad enough that I was going into the race like, okay, I wonder which Hendrick car is going to win today. But I, I just watching some of the racing, I just couldn't get into it. I couldn't, you know, feel any emotion in the racing because I know these guys are, you know, this is not a points race. You know, this is for a million dollars. So it's just like I couldn't really chime well with, you know, the racing because it just wasn't. There and the com- Mike Daryl said the commentators wasn't making it very interesting either. So I, I'm not gonna lie, I stopped watching about like halfway through. Great stuff, right there, even, Michael. Go ahead, Chris. I didn't even turn the TV. On. I didn't even turn the TV on. I uh, I made a bold claim last week that I was gonna boycott, and I did not turn the TV on. I did not think about a NASCAR race this week. Other than the fact that I'm just ready for the LI 400. So, in so in the words of uh, Bill Belichick, it's not on to Cincinnati; it's on to Nashville. I couldn't agree more. And here's the problem with All Star races: there's like, and this is nothing against them, and nothing against like any other All Star game, but it seems like all-star games or all-star events don't like have anything like significant other than like the cash prize and it's hard for like people to like actually enjoy it when there's like nothing that like guarantees it or nothing that like benefits somebody like other than the cash like i said but yeah it's just tough to like get into the whole thing and it was just it wasn't great and i totally agree with you three i even saw like little bits of it and it's like Ugh, like, not, not, not really. Like, I'm sorry. I mean, it was impressive that Kyle Larson won, and that was his third win, which is kind of good. Like, pretty impressive, if you ask me. But other than Kyle Larson winning his third race, it didn't really, like, agree with me. It's like eating a month-old cheesesteak, Philly cheesesteak. It doesn't really taste that great honestly and i think i can and larry probably will maybe agree with this analogy i probably compare the all-star race to 
auto club racing. If that makes any sense, because he has a strong opinion of auto club sucking. So, just my friendly take and just our friendly take, but I think we could all agree the All-Star race wasn't that great. Did Larry B. ever end up typing in his question? I'm sorry, what? Did Larry type in his question? I'm Uh, dying to hear it. Yeah, it says, which of the following series would Travis Pastrana do best in? NASCAR, NHRA, IndyCar, or F1? Or Formula One, sorry. I can see him doing uh, NHRA. (laughs) Well, his NASCAR stint didn't go that well. Um, The other ones also don't really, I'm going to be honest, he's more of the extreme sports, hanging out to the tires blow out type deal. And the other motorsports need a lot more finesse than he's used to. So honestly, probably the NHRA. But ironically, he's also been doing some offshore boat racing. He actually won a race not too long ago with um, Miss Geica. All right, so we got two votes for NHRA. What about you, Chris? You know, they say that this this skill of the driver is basically just hold your the the speak until the. Uh, so I think this will package. I think his best chance to succeed would be right here now. Uh, Chris, uh, do you think you could repeat that again? You kind of cut out a little. Um, um, I think that's the best NASCAR just because um, it, it took a lot of the drugs. Hold on and keep your foot NASCAR. Okay, so we are having a little technical difficulties, but Chris did say that he would do best in NASCAR. So we have two votes for NHRA and then one vote for NASCAR. Based on what Daryl said I and, and how he didn't do great in NASCAR, I kind of would lean toward NHRA, but to each his own. And I, 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 think, I think he can maybe do good in, like, NHRA or IndyCar, but I'm probably going to lead toward NHRA if you ask me. So, again, it's everyone else's opinion, but I think... But I think we are all good, and NHRA is pretty much what the majority agrees on. So, there's that. So, there's that right there. Alright, before we get into more... We get into more racing news and all things that are racing. We are going to actually read our little sponsor here. The the official sponsor of IE Sports Radio is the Southern California Warriors semi-pro football team. The world of semi-pro sports is unlike any other sports organization. Players pay to play in hopes of so many different outcomes, whether it's trying to get film to try out for professional teams, big-time colleges, or playing to stay in shape. No matter what, all semi-pro players have one thing in common, and that's their love for the game. The SoCal Warriors have been on a quest to earn titles and give players second chances since 2017. Whether you're in Southern California or anywhere in the world, give semi-pro sports a chance if you love your sport. You may get that second chance you have been waiting as an athlete. You could follow Southern California Warriors on Twitter, at SoCalWarriors. And then you can follow them on Instagram at Southern California underscore Warriors. And if you are on Facebook, type in the word Southern, then the word California, then the word Warriors. And then once you hit that enter button, they should appear on the top of your search feed. And just like them and follow them. Like they will, they provide great stuff and they are a great organization. So definitely do follow them, and I appreciate, and we all appreciate, Southern California Warriors for being the official sponsor of iSports Radio, your direct feed for all that sports. And on that note, we are going to take ourselves a quick little break. When we come back, we are going to have a lot more to talk about, such as IndyCar, and then we're going to have 
our Formula One talk, which is probably going to be a gist of this. And then we're going to have Nearest the Win in our closing statement. So you are listening to The Extra Mile here on iSports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. We'll be right back after a word from these messages. Ladies and gentlemen, hear me and hear me good. If you like sports, then you like the Wait a Minute show. If you like comedy, then you like the Wait a Minute show. If you like a different opinion coming from a different angle, then you like the Wait a Minute show. So join me Saturday, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time with your host, Jelani J.B. Bodie. And of course, my man Lopan on the Wait a Minute show. College football, and do you want to hear a college football show dedicated to all this college football, including junior college and the Triple CAA and the NJCAA, the NAIA, and the NCAA, including Division Three, Division Two, Division One AA in the FCS, and Division One Single A in the FBS? Well, then look no further. Join myself, Larry B, and my colleagues, Mr. H Town Blake, Blake Henley, and Mr. Christian Espinoza, each week during the college football season for the latest in college football on um, three and out college edition right here on IE Sports Radio, your directory for all that is sports. And welcome back to the Extra Mile. Thank you all for joining us on this beautiful Thursday afternoon for episode 169. And without any further delay, let's get back into the racing action. Let's talk a little IndyCar. So the Chevy Grand Prix race one ended with Marcus Erickson scoring his first career win. He started 15th and worked his way up to the front, ultimately getting the win in the closing laps when Will Power's car would not restart after the red flag. Erickson was able to hold off the lead on a three-lap shootout and take him for his first win. The Chevy Grand Prix Race 2 went to Pat O. Award, and Award made a great late race pass on Joseph Newgarden and held on for the win. And keep in mind, Award started 16th. So... Michael, I know you're a huge on IndyCar. Tell us what you thought of the the races and what you thought of what went on in the Grand Prix Race 1 and 2. I think the racing was really good. I think uh, I, I was always a bit hesitant on street circuits because, you know, as an F1 fan, Monaco is a great track, but it can really get a little dull. Um, I think the racing around Detroit was really great. Um, the strategy really did definitely played a huge part in both races. And uh, I'm honestly just glad to see Marcus Erickson win because, um, you know, he was a former F1 driver. And, you know, when you don't do well in Formula 1, you know, chances are you might find success in another series. And I'm just glad to see a former F1 driver take to the track and do really good that weekend. All right, cool. Very, very cool. I didn't even know he was a Formula or blah, blah, blah. former Formula One, Formula One race car driver. So that's a pretty good Snapple fun fact right there, Michael. So Daryl or Chris, did you two want to chime in on this? I didn't even mention. I was on uh, dad duty pretty much all weekend, and 
So I actually, I didn't watch a single lap of racing. Oh, well, I saw Rex. That's the only thing I watched this weekend. It's all good, and we all know that you're a busy man, and daddy duty always comes first before racing duty. So how about you, Daryl? Did you watch any of the Chevy Grand Prix race one or two? I actually watched both of the races, and I will say wherever they got these youngins from, which uh, apparently was Formula One, can we get more of them, please? Because these new kids in Formula One are hungry and aggressive, and they are letting it all hang out. And when you make a racetrack like Detroit, which we've talked about this race for many years on this show, not being that exciting, and you turn it into must-see television, it's amazing. And I said it on Twitter, and I'll say it again. These new kids in IndyCar, they all right. The sport is in good hands. Can't wait to see what the future holds for it. I can't wait for it either, and this is absolutely good. When it comes to like youngins winning these races, it's really fascinating because it just goes to show you that we're getting a new variety of winners, and we're not getting like the same old, same old winning every single time. Like the fact that Marcus Erickson was able to win his first race despite starting fifteenth was absolutely amazing. Like. And it's always a great feeling to win your first race. It always is that great feeling to get that that first win off your chest because now you build momentum and then you get people wondering who you are. Whereas if you're, I mean, you if you if you finish like second or third, you get people wondering, hey, this guy finished second and third. But if you're winning your first race and then people are now wondering your name and you're they're actually starting to figure who you are and you're basically doing everything possible then you're doing your job and it's honestly just a great feeling and you two couldn't have said it better or you three couldn't have said it better that the race the sport of racing is in great hands with all these youngins and it it's really good and the same can be said for award who who won race two and it was great that both of both races were able to hold off despite getting a little bit of, not like trouble, but just they were able to hold on and get the win because it's never easy to like to hold on to a lead. And sometimes it gets, all the pressure starts to build on you, especially if you haven't won an event for your first time. So that's just my little spiel of it. And let's just jump to Formula One as that was indeed a great race though. So... So in Formula One, Pirelli investigated themselves and found that they were not at fault. They claim that team negligent, ne- negligence caused the tire failures, which, while may be true, is always suspicious when you clear yourself of any wrongdoing. To sum up the tire regulations, teams have to adhere to very strict tire rules and measured based on cold temperatures. Teams may not take the blankets off the tires more than 30 seconds before pulling out onto the track as that will consider cooling off the tires and therefore the team will be reported to the stewards. Teams may not change the gas used inside the tire. And heading into the French Grand Prix, Max Verstappen leads the championship and Red Bull Racing leads the constructors. Lewis Hamilton has won both of the French Grand Prix since its return from 2018. And as everyone knows, it was last canceled last year due to COVID, which we're probably not going to talk about that again. So anyway, so Chris, talk about this whole little tire situation. What can you say about this whole little tire situation and how everything has just like gone complete? May- mayhem when it came when it came to this whole tire thing. Chris, you there? Um, you might be having technical difficulties again. Um, what was your question? Okay, so I was asking about the tire you know? He was asking. Yeah, we got you. We got you. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Stupid. Like, um, so I find it, I always find it interesting when people clear themselves of any wrongdoing. And from what I understand, Pirelli has almost been granted more power by F1. If you read the new, the 
the regulation updates that were put out, uh, Pirelli basically, they were giving, given full faith by F1, which I think is an interesting move coming off these tire failures. And, you know, whether it was team negligence, you know, interfering with tire pressures and stuff like that. Um, at the end of the day, I don't buy it. Um, it, it's just, they, they failed in the same spot, the same race. Both teams said that they didn't do anything. Both teams cooperated, sent all of their tire data in, insist that they didn't do anything wrong. And Red Bull isn't going to send in their tire data unless they are sure that they didn't do anything wrong. So they won't, they won't comply. And I would have to assume the same thing for, uh, for Aston Martin, but maybe not. Um, I don't know. I just, I find the whole situation fishy. And at the end of the day, Pirelli came out of it with more sanctioning power over teams than they went into, uh, the race with. So it's, it's just a very interesting situation for me personally. Yes, I totally agree. This whole, when I first saw the news, I'm like, what in the world? And, Something that strikes me odd is how do you clear yourself of wrongdoing? Like, that is totally, like, weird. Like, either you did you did it or you didn't do it. Like, it's so strange. And according to this little article, Verstappen pretty much said they have – they had to look at the – look at the tires themselves. And he says that they didn't do anything wrong and they couldn't bl- put the blame on – team for stopping and red bull and whatnot so it's just so such a strange situation that's been going on when it came to formula one and i don't know i don't whoever whatever's been going on with formula one everyone needs to like get to the bottom of this because just because this seems so odd and strange that when it comes to like cooling tires and then the whole 32nd thing it's just so strange so Michael or Daryl, did you two want to chime in on this whole little tire situation from Formula One? Of course I do. You know I've got comments. Um, (laughs) This feels like a situation where Pirelli's like, no, you did it, and we're going to make sure to make changes to make sure you didn't do it. And Aston Martin and Red Bull are like, we didn't do anything. And why are you trying to blame us for something that you did? Of course, Pirelli's never going to admit they did something wrong. That proves that the tires are unsafe, and that would get them into a lot of trouble. See USA 2005. The teams aren't going to back down because that's going to open up into more scrutiny from the F1 sanctioning body. And unlike Ferrari, the other teams don't have the secret, double secret, we will punish you, but we're never going to tell anybody how we actually punished you deal that Ferrari has. So it's a lot of he said, the she said, but they said, here's where, here's where I go for it when it comes to this tire pressure thing. Goodyear and Pirelli do the same thing with the tire pressures where they have a window where they want the tires to be used. For the most part, teams ignore it because they know that lower tire pressures, even below that safety, means more grip. So... The difference of Formula One is they're going 200 miles per hour. It's a very bad situation when tires fail. And, of course, NASCAR is going the same speed, but NASCAR, they're in a tank, and in, and Formula One is basically two wheels removed from a motorcycle. So I get the focus on the safety of the tires, but Pirelli has been in a situation where the tires have been scrutinized by everybody, and they're trying to save face. It's going to go away for now, but if I'm Formula One, to be honest, I'm trying to see if somebody wants to come and make more tires because this Pirelli thing ain't working out. And it hasn't been working out for for years. Like these, This issue started around in 2011 where the tires didn't couldn't last like five laps and they would have to have like five pit stops for, per race. And then it goes into 2013 where tires were cutting down left and right. Uh, See Lewis Hamilton at Great Britain where he just ran on the rumble strip and the tire blew. And to be honest with you, this 
Kyer hasn't really gotten any better since then. And I, I like, I would agree with Daryl. I think they should start looking for new tire brands. Uh, see Firestone, maybe Goodyear again. I don't know, but this tire ain't it. Yeah, I totally agree with this whole thing as well. And find better. And my thing is this: How come there's like no surveillance of like anyone like messing with this? Unless they're like, why aren't people like looking at the surveillance, like wondering, hey, this person was the one that tampered with it, or instead of just having everyone play the blame game and point fingers at everybody and say, oh, I didn't do it. No, I didn't do it. No, I didn't do it. So. It's just something strange that's happening, and I totally agree with what Michael said. Like, get tires that actually work, like Goodyear, Michelin, whatever, whatever the case may be. Like, it's so strange. Like, they need to like squash this whole thing and just get everything back on track because something that Lewis Hamilton actually said was safety is always the priority. And for me and my team, there have been clear rules and guidelines as to where we have to operate. So I was very surprised to see they had to clarify those. Obviously you can take what you want from that. And then he says that he's happy that they acknowledge that they needed to clarify it and whatnot. And they haven't been policing tires and whatnot. So overall, I just think this whole thing is like one big cluster and I hope Formula One can like correct everything because I totally agree with Hamilton. Safety is the biggest priority because no one wants to like put themselves at risk when it comes to like racing. Like no one should ever, ever, ever have to do that. So we'll see how it goes. Racing is more of a risk, but... The thing about it is, like, we should able we should be able to not worry so much for safety because it's it's Formula One. There's always a risk of seriously injuring yourself, but there doesn't need to be a overarching issue of tires blowing up, engines catching on fire. It, it doesn't need to be any of that. Like, the more you increase safety, the better we feel about these guys racing. And that's a good point right there, Michael. Very good point. And did you, did uh, Chris and Daryl, did either of you two have anything else to add regarding this whole thing? Uh, well, I'm pro- well, I'll let Christopher go, then I'll go. Because this, this, what I have to say ties back to something I've been saying for a couple of years now. And I think via my text today to you guys, I think you guys know what's coming, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, so... Those comments from Lewis Hamilton were such underhanded digs, which I'm fine with. I I appreciate those. But abiding by a clear set of rules, come on, if you're not cheating, you're not racing. Everybody knows that, for one. And for two, uh, you know, he, he said, like, oh, my team and me, we ran our tire pressures where they're supposed to be because we value safety blah, 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 and Max Verstappen and Red Bull messed with their tire pressures unsafe. They got what was coming to them. But after the race, I don't know if you guys remember, but they said that Lewis Hamilton's tires were destroyed when they took them off the car. Mm-hmm. So what? So it's just interesting to me that Lewis Hamilton comes out and says, like, my tires are fine, and we did everything right. But at during the coverage of the race, before this investigation came out to be what it was, Lewis Hamilton's tires were destroyed. Like, they, they, they were happy they came in because of how bad these tires were. So, to me, it's just interesting that we also go from, it was debris on the track that caused this. And that's, they insisted at the race, oh, it was debris. It was debris. It happened in the same place. It was debris. And now suddenly, you know, it's these teams cheating. It's just an interesting spiral to me. So my issue with Formula One is, and I've said this a couple of years, how they do accidents. They regulate accidents, like not like racing crashes, like traffic accidents, where they try to assign blame to everything. And there's, 
avoidable contact is not a thing in motorsports because you're going too fast. Stuff happens. I don't think avoidable contact is a thing unless you're Nikita Mazepin and just an absolute idiot. That's a story for another day. This tire, whatever this is, is just reeks of yet another over-regulation of motorsport by the FIA. And the way I look at it, if Red Bull and Aston Martin ran their tires too low, and they ended up popping. That's on them. They took the risk. They get the blame. You know, and maybe it's because I've been a NASCAR fan a lot longer than I've been following F1, so a lot of this stuff that they do that people say is normal, it just doesn't gel with me. Like, Goodyear isn't going down there checking the tire pressure and say, oh, you're five, you're five PSI low. We're going to go tell NASCAR. Like, who cares? It's like, okay, you're five PSI below the, you know, below I recommend it. Oh, the tire doesn't blow out, and they go off and do their own thing. Like, allow the Formula One team's areas to breathe. And if they want to take the, play this game with the tires and want to end up losing one, fine. That's on you. But the, the continued over-policing of Formula One, I, I'm over it. Like people talk about how thick the NASCAR rule book is. I shudder to think what a physicalized copy of the F1 regulations look like. War and Peace probably has less pages than it. So, so you would prefer that you know these like NASCAR and Formula One would uh, lessen the rules or like give these teams more more of a say in what they do during the weekend. Lessen it a little bit. Don't go overboard to where we get Group C again, because that didn't work for anybody. But give them a little wiggle room to do things. Oh, they added 12 pages of tire regulation. Uh, pages of regulations. It's just crazy, you know. A dozen that, pages for tires. And, you know, and it, it's all about, you know, how they, Pirelli is developing a cold temperature curve so that they can calculate out how, when it warms up, what the tire pressures will be. So that way, they're going to be uh, checking tires. As soon as they get taken off that car, they take a tire pressure, and then they put it on that cold temperature curve to check the tire pressures as soon as it comes off the car. You know, it's that, and they're doing it every tire that comes off of every car, every stop. And it's just like, where does it end? Like, these teams need advantages. They need a way to make themselves stick out. And if they do something stupid and run tires at a not recommended pressure, that's on them. And that's the way that it should be. And at least in NASCAR, they haven't really enforced that yet. And as a result, you know, it makes for interesting late-stage racing when you go back with just a few to go. Mm -hmm. And just on the Lewis Hamilton tires thing, that guy, what he does on old tires should be illegal. Like, there's no reason his tires should last as long as they did. Yeah, that does seem a little... A little like fascinating right there and a little shady right there. As we all know that Max Verstappen unfortunately got into the accident and that accident actually wound up costing him a victory and a chance to extend his four point championship lead over Lewis Hamilton. But he said he was quite lucky that he hit the wall on the right because it could have been a lot worse for him. And had he gone left, it could have been a bigger impact. And he was clearly sad and disappointed that he didn't win. But he said he was fortunate to walk away from that incident. And he lives to drive another day. And he, and hopefully, again, like I said, I hope this whole thing does get resolved because nothing sucks worse than losing off of like a technical issue. Like the only thing that would suck worse is if you were, you lost after you led and then the other driver just came out from behind and just 
swooped in and stole the win from you. So we'll see what happens when it comes to the world of Formula One. But this is quite a bit of drama. And to add to those uh, page, to add to that page little comment, it seems like the tire rules are going to have more rules than the unwritten rules of the MLB. <laughs> uh, I, 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 oh, don't get me started on. We are on the wrong show to get that because we will never get off here. <laughs> I'm no. I'm just trying to be a little funny and have a little fun. <laughs> but anyway, on the topic of fun, we are in the last few minutes of our show, so it's time for nearest the win. So we'll start with race by race. So we'll start with the NASCAR race at Nashville. So who do you all got for winning the NASCAR race at Nashville? We'll start with you, Daryl. Uh, I'm just going to keep the Hendrick train roll. Actually got to make sure I can pick this guy before I even keep the Hendrick train rolling. But, uh, if I can, I'm going to take Kyle Larson to win this deal. Um, the Hendrick guys just don't stop winning. Not much else I can say about that, and I think that continues. They haven't lost a race since May the 9th. I think it goes on. This team has found the 2007 Fountain of Youth, and they're going to keep drinking from it. All right, so Kyle Kyle Larson is Daryl's pick. Who do you got, Michael? I'm going to go with Alex Bowman. Oh, you bet. <laughs> <laughs> The Ally 48 or the Ally 400. Alex Bowman. So Alex Bowman. Uh, Michael, could you could you say uh, your uh, pick again? Um, I'll change it to uh, Kyle Larson. No, you, know, you don't have to change it. All right, I'll just stick with Bowman then. All right, so my pick for the NASCAR race at Nashville is... I'm going to actually go wild card on you and go Chase Elliott. I could, I could see it. Wow, that's such a wild card. We're, I, picking, I, we're picking such underdogs for this race on Sunday. I actually really wouldn't be surprised to see Willie B take it, though. Okay, he has been strong all year long, and he's got another one due to him soon. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Guys, you might end up having a hot win. Yeah, and that's the unique thing about... Unlikely. Sorry. Sorry, go ahead, Chris. I'm sorry. I said unlikely. <laughs> yeah. But that's the unique thing about these races. Like, It's like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. And honestly, we've been getting so many different like winners in some of these races. It's so crazy. And we've had different winners throughout not just NASCAR, but in IndyCar and Formula One as well, which on that note, next race we got for nearest the win is the IndyCar race at Road America. Daryl, who you got? IndyCar is such a hard series to pick normally, and this year it just feels like it's even more of a crapshoot because there's so many good drivers, which is a great problem to have, by the way. Except for the fact that it makes it hard to try and pick it, and that's why most of my points have come from zeros here. I think I'm going to go Renus. V- Wait, is Renus racing this weekend? No, he's not, so I can't go Renus VK. I forgot about that. I think I'm going to go Marcus Erickson. Really? Question mark, question mark. I don't know. I mean, there's like seven or eight different drivers in the win right now. It's so hard to pick who's going to win. You know what? I'm going to go. I'm going to go Erickson, especially with all the young guns too. Like they can really strike out at any point, which is crazy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like you have no idea who's going to break out next. Probably Volteri Botas next season. <laughs> Shade. Poor Botas. All right. So, so Botas for Chris and uh, Michael. Botas, huh? No, he's not going Botas. It was a joke. Oh, uh, it was a joke. Michael will take Botas. I was 
care. <laughs> uh, Chris, just restate, just restate your pick for the record. Yeah, I, I didn't pick yet. I was waiting to see what oh, Michael okay. did. Michael, go ahead. Uh, I'm going to go with Max Verstappen. Mm, okay. No, no, let's pick an Indy. Indy car, yeah, Indy car, Michael. Okay, okay. And, uh, Max Verstappen is going to do a one-off in Indy car. Oh, okay, I'm just joking. Um, I'm going to go with, you know, Kevin Magnuson is racing this weekend. Let's, I'm going with him. Oh, wow. The underdog pick. Or not even the underdog. We're like a surprise pick. True. And for me, for the second time this year, I'm going to take a gamble on Will Power. I was thinking of going with Will Power myself, but I actually picked Colton Herta for this one. That's not a bad one. Mm-hmm. And then last but certainly not least, we have the Formula One at the French Grand Prix. Daryl, who's your pick? That's a really good question. Um... I think it's going to be Lewis Hamilton who strikes back with a vengeance, but that team needs to strike back with a vengeance. They have had two bedwetter races in a row. Mercedes cannot, cannot, cannot afford a third. You, you know, I on that note, from memory on Twitter. Did you see the stat that this is their worst season? That's weird. That's yeah, a weird see the stat, I think uh, I think uh, WTF one or Motorsport they put a graph on t- on a uh, uh, they uploaded a graph and it showed that this is actually Mercedes' worst season. I believe it though because Botas has been nowhere to be seen all the year long. Like, it, granted, you know it's. It's crazy to think that this is their worst season and they're still fighting for a championship, but, <laughs> you know, the stats are there. So what do you got, Michael? Not the French. Um, I'm going to go with uh, Rostop and striking back with a vengeance. All right. And for me, it looks like Michael and I are tied together yet again because Verstappen is going to increase that lead over Lewis Hamilton and Mercedes. Well, you, you may never know. Perez might uh, might do something crazy again. For, hey, he could. He looks really good. Yeah, Verstappen has been great all season, and the fact that he's got a lead over Hamilton is phenomenal. But I'm going to go with Daryl's pick, and I'm going to go with Lewis Hamilton myself. Thank you, the on this season that Verstappen didn't win or finish second. Mm. You know, it's crazy. Baku was the first time in like four years that we saw a Red Bull 1-2 on track. Yeah. I don't recall. I, I couldn't remember the last time. It would, it would be like 2013 or something like that, but that was the last time I've seen a Red Bull 1-2 like running on track. Daryl, our numbers guy, he's probably working on it right now. It has been, I think it hasn't been since the Vettel domination days, since we've seen them have a 1-2, to be honest. like it, it has been quite a while since that team has been on top like this. They've got a great car, I will say it. Whether or not that will continue into 2022, who knows, but... To end out this era of Formula One, Mercedes has got one heck of a challenge, and they have not been up to the task so far. Mm-hmm. Yep, I totally agree. And honestly, it, it it's it's been quite the weird year. I know we're still we're coming off of a post pandemic year, but I'm a little surprised to see Lewis Hamilton and Mercedes just not living up to its full expectations, but at least we're getting something unique and new. It's not just the same dominating thing over and over and over again. But on that note, that is going to do it for today's episode Wait, of the Extra it, Mile. It, it Sorry. Like I didn't hear yeah. you. Oh, you made yeah, it. Yeah, took Verstappen. Oh, okay. Yeah. I said you and I are going to dominate this weekend together. <laughs> oh, yeah, we will. 
Mm-hmm. Goddard, Hamilton, and Verstappen are going to crash into turn one, but let's not hope that doesn't happen. Yeah, let's hope not. And then Perez wins. <laughs> and the Perez wins by the full. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes, and if God you... God knows Ferrari can't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> did, you, did you guys see where um, uh, out of the house camp today? Where Schumacher said that he needs to, he doesn't trust Mazepin on the track anymore, and he needs to rebuild that trust between teammates. After what he did during practice, I wouldn't trust him either. I mean, after the dude like throws a block at you at 200 miles per hour when you're supposed to be on the same team, I wouldn't trust him either. Well, like, that was absolutely insane what he did. And then uh, you're talking about the last lap, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because. Uh, yeah, uh, the driver who must not be named blamed Schumacher for that. Oh my goodness! He said that it was it was his fault, not not he who must not be named was not at fault, according to he who must also, not be. Also, I feel like he should well, be in a lot well, more. Well, guys, we're up against it, oh, and right. I just want to thank Taryn. Thank you so much for jumping in and hosting on such short notice. Uh, I had to come all the way from. One region of my state to the other, um, thanks to you know my new job with Southern Maryland News. If you guys saw that on Twitter, make sure you give my paper a follow and make sure you subscribe as well. It would really, I would really appreciate it mm-hmm. for uh, numerous reasons. But um, thank y'all, thank you so much, Taryn, for being here. And we we could go on a Mosman dunking spree all night. So I just want to close out. Then we can resume the dunking. <laughs> yep. Dunk as, dunk as much as you want. And on that note, that is going to end tonight's episode of The Extra Mile. Make sure you follow The Extra Mile on Twitter at Extra Mile ISR. Follow Daryl Kinsey Jr. on Twitter at DK Jr. 12. Follow Michael Ward on Twitter at Michael underscore Ward 25. And you can follow Christopher Lehman on Twitter at Fiji Sims, and he's already given his little story on how he got that Twitter name, but that's besides the point. And you can follow me on Twitter at Taryn Rodriguez one. And if you want to play nearest the wind, definitely do let us know hashtag nearest the wind, and feel free to enter your picks for the NASCAR at Nashville, IndyCar at Road America, and Formula One at the French Grand Prix. But on that note, that is going to do it for today's episode of The Extra Mile. For Daryl, Chris, and Michael, my name is Taryn Rodriguez. Have yourself a great rest of the evening, and we will see you on the next Green Flag. Good night, everybody. Good night.